Yes, uh, good morning, uh, everybody. And uh, this is uh, Friday morning, uh, January 29th, and it's uh, committee, Senate Committee on Agriculture's uh, meeting. Um, so today, uh, we're going to, this morning to start with, we're just going to chat about yesterday's uh, two hour meeting and and how that how you think that went and and uh, the ups and downs of it and and uh, we have uh, the law clerk uh, from the council that works with Michael O'Grady uh, Kelly McGill with us and uh, she was attending the meeting and uh, then um, we'll um, move on to Ellen Keeler at 10 o'clock or so she can come and we're going to get uh, switch over to our our uh, food issue and food security and all that. Uh, Brian has to leave us, Senator Collimore, at 9.30 for a meeting with Dr. Levine in regards to an issue in his county. And Anthony uh, right now is meeting uh, with Dr. Levine on an issue uh, in regards to COVID in Washington County, and he'll be uh, returning when that meeting is over. So um, with that, um, I, um, I thought yesterday's meeting went uh, pretty smooth for having uh, such a, a large crowd. Um, I thought Michael Pishak and, and um, F, uh, DFR did a good job. Uh, you know, they drilled down pretty good, I thought, for, a, for a, an outfit that doesn't normally deal with, with dairy and, and all that. Uh, I thought they drilled down pretty, pretty well and uh, presented uh, a lot of good info. So uh, I, I don't know what you guys got away from it. Uh, Brian, Brian Calmore. Yeah, thank you, Bobby. I agree. And I think it was refreshing because they, they were new eyes on the topic. They, just as you point out, Mr. Chair, they don't normally deal with agricultural or certainly with dairy issues. So it was good to see that um, from a fresh perspective, many of the same issues came up. Unfortunately, because the issue was so big and so large and so weighty, uh, they didn't come up with any you know, really quick solutions either. Um, but that makes, up, makes me feel better to say, hey, at least we didn't miss something that was really obvious as a way out of this. You know, as long as the federal milk market order is in place, there's relatively little wiggle room uh, for a state like Vermont, which is landlocked on all sides. And that was a big issue um, with respect to the difference between us and Maine. Um, I mean, there are some things we could probably do, but it isn't as easy as just flipping a switch and saying, okay, well, we fixed that problem now next. So I thought it was very good. I thought Linda did a great job keeping uh, track of the next person coming on to, to uh, testify and, uh, yeah, I thought it was a great meeting. Yeah, uh, Chris, uh, do you want to weigh in? Well, I, I guess I was wanting to ask everybody else if you heard real proposals that we should work on, because I, I heard them coming to a lot of dead end conclusions, which is reflects our, you know, I mean, there's, there's hundreds of people in Vermont that want to help. But how to do it is another question. And so I did not pick up on, you know, here's one or two things you might try. And I'm curious if I just missed it. I haven't had time to digest the full report closely, but um, just so, curious. Can you guys hear me? My internet's pretty bad. I can hear you, but the video is not working. Yeah. yeah. Um, you, actually I, you, know, look, you look better with that little round guy there, Perry. 
<laughs> I appreciate it. Um, uh, I think, you know, I agree with Senator Pearson that, you know, there might not have been one or two solutions, but there is a common theme I've been hearing, especially when it comes to dairy farmers, and it's what do we need to do to help provide resources to help them run their farm like a business, how to help them with bookkeeping, and then even managing, um, you know, kind of helping them with, with, with managing some of their risks and, you know, the ups and downs. So, you know, I think we've got to, you know, I, I don't know what the solution is, but, you know, kind of figure out what we can do around creating a program or investing some more money into, you know, education systems. Maybe it's something we work with the state colleges with. Do they have a program that we can help fund as they're looking for ways to create new revenues that would help out our dairy farmers, you know, as, as they look to improve their business practices? Uh, plus, um, you know, we did earlier, we've heard from the ag agency about um, when we asked the question, how come or why didn't 100% of our farmers sign up for our programs? And it came back that some of them didn't qualify because they didn't have good bookkeeping uh, records. So, so that kind of verified, you know, the two agencies totally separate from each other kind of verified the fact that some, some bookkeeping practices on some farms could be improved. And, and what we have done as a committee over the years is first thing we did many years, well, maybe 10, 12 years ago is create that farm viability program that Gus runs. And you know, that, that came right out of our ag committee and it's helped, you know, a tremendous number, but we, we still are getting people that need more training. Uh, Chris. I, I'm, thanks for the reminder, Mr. Chair, because I wanted to ask you that. This week we heard um, uh, one of the gentlemen say he wanted to retire. He needed help planning for that. And it made me think of yep. ag viability. We've heard people need technical support around bookkeeping. So all of those are actually handled through the, the, the ag viability program. Uh, but, but it was as though folks hadn't even heard of it. So, um, you know, and, and Ella, and she's transitioning out, but there's a scale issue, I guess, right? If she's helping three dozen farms a year, um, that doesn't, that doesn't, I mean, it makes a dent, but it's not really addressing the challenge. And so I, I guess my question for you, Bobby, because you know more about it than just about anybody is, is it as simple as, as beefing up funding and amplifying that program or are there gaps that we're hearing about? Because as I was listening, I was thinking they're not gaps, there's probably just an access challenge. Well, yeah, because if, if Gus is, I mean, they're do, they do this on a, a voluntary sort of basis. And what happens is if, if somebody goes to, you know, a bank or a lending agency and they say, well, you haven't, you haven't got a good plan worked out, a business plan worked out. Um, you know, you, you've got to come back with that or you go in to extend your loan and they say, well, you haven't got very good records. Well, these lending institutions suggest to that farmer that they should, you know, contact VHCB and have farm viability come. And so it, it isn't like we're requiring anybody to go there. Um, and I think they do, or they were doing about 50, 50 farms a year. And, um, you know, maybe, maybe somehow we could switch that system a little bit so that 
more, and it doesn't cost the farmers hardly anything to have uh, those folks go and work work up a business plan and and uh, set them up on on a good bookkeeping system. Um, so yeah, we'll have we can have Gus back in sometime and and move forward with that. That, um, that it, is that part of you know there, there's a lot of advocates and activists will say fully fund VHCB fully fund VHCB and every year we notwithstand the structure but but VHCB is is funded by the property transfer tax correct some portion. well the part of it yes some portion of it the property transfer tax this year is booming because our real estate's taking off. Do, my question is, do you know, uh, is the farm viability piece out of that funding or is that something in a separate column? No, it's out of, it's out of their total allotment. And this particular year, that's the governor's recommended that that be fully funded with the transfer tax. Plus, um, you know, we gave we gave them quite a lot of money through the uh, CARES Act too this past yeah. year, and uh, no, uh, you know, over the and Gus usually doubles and triples that money through grants and federal money matching money. Uh, those dollars go go a long, long way. Uh, in helping the um, they talk some and some of the farmers talk some about a a management program uh, in in managing the supply of milk I think that was mentioned uh, or I think even Pshack maybe mentioned that um, about some type of a a supply uh, control or supply management plan that uh, could be put, but he thought that either had to be on a regional or national basis. Uh, did you pick up on any of that, Kelly? Did did you did you pick up on whether um, I I thought Jill talked about that or Michael? Pishak talk, commissioner talked about uh, uh, having a, man, a management tool. Yes, thank you, um, Senator Starr. Jill Rickard with DFR did speak about um, supply management and it's detailed um, in a section of the report that gives several examples of that type of program. Yeah, and uh, so, you know, that, that kind of floated to the top did you did you pick up on other suggestions, Kelly, uh, as you listened uh, to the proceedings? Sure. So, Jill Rickard went through the the different types of options that DFR considered, um, and those include risk management, state pricing orders, regional compacts, um, an increased focus on organic production. And as has already been discussed this morning, increased support for innovation and farm man management. And those are all detailed in, in separate sections of DFR's report. Yeah. See, so, you know, the, there's three or four, half, or five different options that, that was mentioned. And it really, see, in, in our bill that we passed last year, uh, there's a provision where uh, we we deal with what we've done and uh, and then we move it on to a um, to a tax force uh, to be appointed by the president uh, the committee on committees rather and the speaker to dig and drill down deeper. Um, in, in the future, uh, Corey? You know, the, the other thing I was thinking, so we can't control the price they get for milk, but I have a feeling 
we we increase the cost it you know what it costs them to make you know 100 100 pounds of milk so is there things we could do to look at what you know what are we costing dairy farmers in vermont and are there ways we can reduce those costs on them you know on top of buying support because you know we're not gonna be able to help them out in the top end but my guess is you know, it'd be interesting to see what how much milk we produce plus what we cost and what what our impact is on on the price of producing milk and i, be, I bet there's a healthy amount well the input so you're talking about the input costs yeah uh, well, I, we didn't hear, we did hear a little bit about the input costs yesterday, but, you know, they talked about regulations and, and, uh, you know, a, a few of those things, but, you know, most of our farm community is pretty well exempted out of about everything and anything that I've been able to dream up over the the years. Uh, you know, they don't they don't need to register any of their farm vehicles, their farm trucks. Uh, you know, they have to keep lights and and those things. You know, keep them safe, but they don't have to go over to a motor vehicle and lay out a bunch of money for their manure trucks or their feed trucks or their uh, dump trucks. Um, you know, we the, the one issue I think we could talk to Anson about and work on is the large farm fee or uh, I think Walt Gladstone brought up something about about fees um, that he brought up on on one issue I'd have to look back in my notes um, but um, well we know state policy makes their electric bill cost X percentage more you know with efficiency Vermont we know they paid a large farm and medium farm stuff so they consider costs um, that we might be able to um, yeah, but I also, you know, we'd have to get a cost analysis because um, they're running, you know, the lights in about every barn in Vermont have been all changed to LED. The milk bulk tanks have been switched over to cooler plates that run a lot cheaper. Uh, you know, the motors on their silage unloaders are, they've been changed. Uh, you know, they paid in some, but they've also gotten back some. And maybe we should uh, get a cost analysis on, on what they paid in versus what they've gotten out. And, um, and we, we could get that, I think. Uh, Chris? Well, I think that has been done. And the problem of thinking about it in terms of what have I paid on my bill versus what have I got on my in my business is that it, that overlooks the reality that the whole system has the demand on our electric and the whole system is kept down, is, is not grown since 2000 because of these investments. And that saved everybody money. So, so it, it, you know, it's, but it has been quantified and, and clearly their farms are big users. Uh, and so they see a big efficiency bill, but they, you know, that is looked at by the PUC every few years as they come back. The, the analysis is there. I'm sure we could uncover it and have folks walk us through it, but it, it, it's just really hard to, say to an individual who is saying, you know, yeah, I got something, but that was five years ago and I keep having to pay this. And it's very unsatisfying and probably hard to believe that the system overall, the benefit to the entire system benefits each individual repair. And that's really a hard argument to make, but it doesn't change the fact that it's true. Um, so I, I just want to caution that 
we should be careful of diving in too loudly and deeply on on that point because um you know it sort of perpetuates a, a, i think an unfair uh impression that people have about efficiency of vermont yeah and uh brian thanks bobby i do know that uh and i've heard this from farmers directly that administrative costs in terms of uh, permits and all that not always but they can be prohibitive um there are examples where that kind of really held up a farmer from from doing certain things efficiency vermont also has an opt-out program i think if you can find a company that can run its own efficiency program i think there's there's an allowance for for getting out pretty yeah sure. i i had to do that once uh, with one of my smaller businesses you have to prove that that you're doing super good with all these modifications and you can opt out but you spend a lot to get to that point um so i do have to leave in a couple of minutes to go to this uh department of health uh, i don't know whether chris and corey were brought up to speed but we got an email overnight from the Department of Health that there was a virus outbreak in the Rutland area. And Anthony got one that said the same was true in the North Field or in the Washington County area, which I think is Norwich University. I think it's at North Field. I think I heard over 70 cases. So um, they've asked the delegations from each of those areas to meet with Dr. Levine uh, to get more information. So uh, just in case you guys didn't know, I got to step away. but. Anthony should be coming back from his meeting with them. Yeah. Um, the, um, so uh, are there other issues on the input side that, uh, that we could, you know, recommend or talk about that any of you picked up on uh, yesterday or in, in the past, uh, Chris? Um, it's not directly to inputs, but, but, uh, I, we heard, oh, whew, I think it was last year. Maybe it was a year and a half ago of, hello, Anthony, of, um, the folks, uh, it, it was, it was the land trust, I think how they were, uh, got some grants and this had to do with land transition. So it's not inputs, but it is a big issue for, for dairy in particular. People are ready to retire. Uh, and the, the risk of consolidating further where we still have new farmers who are saying, I wish I had, I could get land. You know, it's a, it's a real catch 22. So um, it, to me, it's not about um, necessarily a boost for current farmers it's about helping people transition out and getting new businesses in onto the land and so at some point i'd love us to hear an update there and it's um yeah you know it's it, it's the inputs for the brand new businesses but it doesn't it admittedly wouldn't help somebody that's in the middle of trying to uh improve their business yeah i i don't know if it was yesterday or uh, when the day we had um Walt and Walt Gladstone and all those folks on that a young farmer was saying that they had really severe problems buying just I think it was only like four acres or five acres of of um, ground to grow you know their veggies on and, um, <clears throat> but if you think about that that whole deal there um that would certainly make a difference for the guy that like you said wants to retire yeah. and then get the new person on that land i think it was um k Hart yesterday said was talking about his two neighbor farms that sold out and he said that he didn't ever expect to see another cow on either of those two farms. I said something uh, to that degree. And, um, you know, if there was some way there uh, 
where you could convert that. Uh, even, I don't know if land trust divides property up that, so that instead of having one person own 200 acres, uh, you could divide that so there'd be four 50 acre parcels or, or something. We'd have to, you know, because uh, what we're trying to do is keep blocks of, yeah. of land together. And uh, so I don't know how that, that would go. Um, you know, doing a subdivision of larger parcels into smaller because that isn't good for the ag community when you do that because of transporting and picking up products. And I mean, there's all kinds of tractors on the road and equipment. There's all kinds of issues that crop up when you subdivide land, but I think somehow we got to figure out a system to allow these, these new people in. That's for sure. Yeah. Morning, Anthony. How y'all doing? Uh, well, we've got it pretty well figured out. Oh, How good. Of this problem. Good. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. I wish to hell, heck we uh, did have a way. <laughs> I know. Well, it's only been 40 years. We we're still working on it. Um, the um, um, so did you get any takeaways from that meeting yesterday that that would be helpful or that where we could uh, ask uh, this task force to move toward? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, it just remains really complicated, and you know they talk about the possibility of doing some state price setting but then i run you know i think we, i don't know how you do that without getting through washington without getting some kind of approval from the congress or getting not getting blocked by the congress so i'm i'm really not sure i got any particular new takeaways to be perfectly honest unfortunately yeah uh one i don't know if you guys uh were had picked up at all on but I got to thinking and wondering if if you can only send eighty five percent of your product to the whoever's buying it, but yet they'll still accept the other fifteen percent or part of that fifteen percent. Um, but it's. It, and they are told, well, we'll still take that 10, 15%, but you know, we're only gonna pay you what we get paid for it. And, and I'm wondering if there's a, a smooth way of checking out, well, where did that other percentage go? Did it go? to the uh, powder plant? Did it go to some fluid plant? Uh, did it go to, you know, a cheese plant or did it go in somebody's manure pit? And uh, so I, I don't know if there's a way of, uh, if that all goes through the federal order, that extra or not. Uh, I don't know mm. if, have you guys thought anything? I sort of picked that drift up yesterday and then the day we talked with that other group of, of watershed people that were farmers. Um, no, no comment? No. I mean, didn't they also talk about, uh, like in Maine, they can do it because the milk is, um, sort of staying in Maine, or you can you can set the price for milk that stays in your state, something along those lines. Did I, am I making that up or did, I, did we hear that? No, you heard, you heard it right. Uh, was they at Canada on the north and 
the ocean uh, on the east and right. and they you know they've only got a I don't know a couple hundred farms so right. uh, you know they can control it pretty close the um, but yeah you know, I, I know the guy from Agrimar uh, yesterday he mentioned that um, they they do get a milk premium I. Um, but I, he didn't tell us, of course, how much, and it really isn't any of our business uh, to know. But um, uh, I'm wondering, you know, I haven't heard of, I didn't hear any DFA farmers say they were getting any, any premiums on any of their, uh, their milk, so... It, uh, yeah, I don't know what, what goes on there. Um, I know we did hear, we did hear about milk, uh, milk uh, districts. We're in the Northeast Council or the Northeast District. And if we raised our price too high, then the Midwest District could bring milk in. Um, but that, you know, and that's only, they have to be able to prove that, that we can't supply that product in our own district, I believe. Um, but, um, you know, and, and I don't think we're really, I don't think we're really getting the premiums uh, from our value added products getting back to the farmers, uh, you yeah, know, all, in all cases. Um, what did you have anything, Aunt Anthony? No, instead, I think that's true. You know, we talk about how valuable and important our value added products are, but farmers don't seem to be making any more money because of it. You know, it's just the processors and the sellers get to make more money off of cheese and ice cream and whatnot, but it doesn't necessarily get back to farmers. It also makes me think again about, you know, dreaming the impossible dream kind of thing about how people can get premiums if they market their milk as from, you know, as local or from Vermont, that kind of thing. And I don't know, you know, that's, we've talked about that and it seems so hard to do, but, um, you know, if we could market milk as Vermont milk, and run it through a processing plant that is controlled by Vermont in some way, I think then you could pay higher premiums for that milk and pass it on to the consumer because consumers would be willing to pay more for a Vermont product. They often think they are paying more for a Vermont product, even though it's not a Vermont product or even though, even though they're paying more, doesn't mean that the farmers are getting more. I think people think when they buy cabbage cheese or something that farmers are getting a benefit from that. You know, I think it's, a, it's, it's not necessarily true, but consumers are willing to put out more for those products because they presume that it's benefiting Vermont farmers. And yeah, and there is a reason why people buy cabbage cheese and it, it isn't just because the name, uh, you know, they know it comes or pretty sure it comes from Vermont. It, if you go, you know, I, I don't travel a great deal, but I've traveled a little. And uh, you buy cheese in down south or out west, it, it doesn't taste like our cheese. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, it, it isn't the same. And I, I'm a strong believer that it's, <laughs> Because the way you know our grasses grow and the way our cows are fed and uh, the care that they get, and you know I've I've had testimony uh, over the years uh, past that you get eleven pounds of cheese out of a hundred pounds of milk here in Vermont. And elsewhere, they do good if they get 10 pounds of, of cheese for out of 100 pounds of milk. 
and uh, it our cheeses um, you know so if they taste better and different well what about the yogurt that comes out of here and and you know Ben and Jerry's may be here may be here because of both Ben and Jerry starting the company but you know those sales wouldn't keep up to you know four or five dollars a pint on ice cream if there wasn't something in that ice cream that tasted better and i'd be um, lucky to find a pint for five dollars pardon i think you'd be lucky to find a pint for five dollars oh is it is it more than I, that now yeah uh so they don't, they don't sell their seconds anymore no although I, in St. Albans, I'll put a plug in for them because they're hiring. If you work for them, they send you home with three pints a shift. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's pretty good. Well, why don't you bring some down for us? Get a night job there. <laughs> I might have to. <laughs> um, yeah, it, uh, you know, it's too bad we, we don't tap into that value-added stuff somehow to generate uh you know it wouldn't take a a lot to generate quite a bit of money um yeah, years and years years and years ago and many years ago before cabot was taken over by agrimark um ben and jerry considered buying cabot and bringing it under their wing as a part of their company but they obviously chose not to do that but that would be the ideal situation would be to have a Ben and Jerry sort of not have them build a, build a milk bottling plant, you know, and take over the milk market instead of just using their cream. The, uh, the lady though, that was on uh, a couple of days ago from up, up above St. Albans in your district, uh, Corey, boy, I, I couldn't believe that, it costs a dollar a jug to buy them damn jugs and, and a nickel a cap for the caps. And I don't know how much the labels were, but you know, you lose. And I was going to say, she, she actually got the final calculation to me for Senator Polina, too. I'll bring up now. They've got $200,000 total invested into that operation. So you got to sell a lot of gallons of milk at. Yeah. Making three bucks after your other costs to make up that two hundred thousand. Well, yeah. and I was struck. She said people don't come for milk, right? They come for some beef, and then they get some milk uh, or some maple syrup. You know that that's also, I think, very uh, important for us to notice that it's not a driver of behavior, but but it, it's an ancillary. Uh, you know, so it's not viable for everybody that doesn't have that diversified option. Yep. Yeah, that, um, yeah, that was amazing that they come to buy other products and um, the, uh, but boy, the, on a $5, how the hell, how does, um, yeah. How does uh, Agrimar, um, you know, sell milk for three dollars and eighty nine cents? And and here's she's the lady was trying to get five dollars and basically hardly breaking even. Uh, you I'm know, guessing they buy jugs for ten cents a jug, not a dollar a jug, and their labels are probably multiple per penny. Yeah. Um, well, Kelly, have you got any words of wisdom to tell yeah, us? Yeah, Kelly, draft a bill. Dra draft us a bill to fix this, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that I'm able to at this point, but I'll know if I can. <laughs> um, the, um, no, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it's hard to figure out, um, you know, the ins and outs of, of all of this. Uh, I think it's it's going to take, um, you know, bits and pieces 
and then you put it all together and it ends up to you know amount to some savings and and a little bit a little bit of extra income and and uh, the uh, we had one one witness that said they could live on what seventeen dollar and a half uh, milk. Uh, but we didn't have we didn't have too many jump on that bandwagon real quick uh, you know after it was said uh, pardon um, I think while we continue to come up with strategies and look for solutions to help dairy we also owe it to the rural communities in our ag economy to make sure we're, you know, we're moving barriers for other farmers. I mean, we've seen, we've seen meat producers, you know, really exploding. We're seeing um, a drive for local foods. Um, you know, our folks who remember that woman down in Addison County who, put up a farm stand, she could no longer get a truck. She put up a farm stand and and was selling out. You know, I mean, we're, we're coming back to the old, you know, get vegetables at the side of the road and make money. And and I just want us, obviously we, dairy is incredibly important, but um, you know, in 10, 15, 20 years, I think the state will be better off if we're slightly more imbalanced where, uh, you know, all, all eyes are not on dairy and, and we need to, I think, broaden what it means to, to have successful farms in Vermont um, while we continue to do figure out strategies for dairy. So uh, just, just put that out there because um, we could spend all session hoping we come up with something meaningful for dairy. And uh, in a way we, we risk perpetuating um, what, I th what I think is clear to a lot of people that we're perhaps um, top heavy in the ag sector with dairy. I, you know, I, I kind of wish that wasn't the case and, and, but, but it doesn't change the reality that I think the future is, is in a broader, more diversified uh, sector um, to keep our economy humming in the rural parts of the state, for sure, especially. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's, you know, there's no reason to believe that the loss of dairy farms is not going to continue. Um, it's just it's just the way, it's, the reality, when you get the best minds together to try to figure out what to do about it. I don't mean our minds, I mean the broader, broader. group that we talk to. Um, you know, nobody has a, nobody has a workable solution i guess i'd call it i mean there's just it doesn't seem to be one out there it's like we're drifting along like letting the industry call the shots and the industry wants bigger and bigger you know it makes it easier for them so i do think it's a the wake up call would be to make sure that we do everything we can to make sure that agriculture is strong in the state realizing that dairy is we're not it, our ability to strengthen dairy is quite limited if not possible so we should be better off making sure that we balance it out with a more diversified farm economy, which is difficult in itself, but, um, you know, it just, I don't know what else there is to do. But you don't want to forget, you know, in this process that if you have four acres of strawberries, uh, raspberries, you can, you can make, quite a lot of money uh, and you can't, you know, you can't expect to keep our open spaces and our fields green and, and our brush away from our fields if you don't have some, some major agricultural production going on on quite a lot of this land. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I think there's room for there's room for both um, and and right now we're we're trying to I mean I I think our committee is 
trying to advance these small um, types of agricultural production, um, whether it's berries or sheep or goats or whatever, but at the same time maintaining the the larger part of our dairy or our, our land base to keep that active and actively farmed and and looking good to you know while this all this transaction is is happening uh Corey? yeah uh there's a saying that's always stuck with me was that the dairy cows paid the taxes long before the maple trees did um and also that you know when you look at how important dairy is not just on the farm my whole manufacturing infrastructure in Franklin County and ultimately Northwestern Vermont is dairy based. You know, it's Ben and Jerry's, it's Berry Calibo chocolate, it's cheese at, you know, up in Enosburg. So we still need to figure out ways to make, you know, milk come in those doors. Um, that being said, uh, I do think, you know, we, I would be really interested in spending time on what we can do to increase, um, you know, whether it's, it's, it hits a couple pieces, both helping out dairy farmers um, diversify, but also food security. We really have to figure out this meat processing shortage and seeing what we can do to invest um, or adjust regulations to make it a little easier. I was talking to a processor or a farmer yesterday who said, I can take a cow down to the local butcher to have him cut it for me and they cut it for like a, whole, a half, but he can't cut it for USD, you know, for me to sell. So he goes, there's some capacity in the system, but because of regulation, like, I just can't have them do it for those purposes. So, you know, anything we can do, I think, and I don't know how much of it's federal versus state, but so much, anything we can do, I think we need to try to address this year, even if it's a temporary adjustment while we kind of work through this shortage. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the meat stuff, I remember back in, I don't know, Chris, you might remember, I think it was back in 2000 or, or earlier when we were talking about the fact that Vermont had lost half its milk pro meat processing plants so in the while Howard Dean was governor, I think is what the, what, the, what we were talking about. But I, I like Michael Bobby said as well, I mean, we need the, you know, I'm not implying that we don't need the dairy economy, you know, I just, and I think that there'll always be, always meaning foreseeable future. We will have the milk to go into those plants to do the Ben and Jerry's and the, the cheese plants and all that because there'll always be a direct way to, to meet those the needs of those plants. I think that'll that we won't that will not go away. Um, but I also think that what we need is some kind of larger larger farms that are livestock based, which is different than milking cows. You know, I'm not and again I'm not against milking cows, but. I think that what we what we need to do is to plan for other kinds of livestock based agriculture to keep the land base open, because you're right, you know, planting berries is not going to keep the land base open. Um, but but meat, you know, livestock farming, you know, whether it's sheep or, or meat, you know, beef, whatever it might be, um, will can go a long way to sort of make to maintain that open land base, which then other farmers need in terms of the manure and the land access to the land and whatnot. <laughs> but I really agree with the, the milk, the meat processing stuff just seems incredible that we can't find a way to like make that work, knowing that there's an ability to produce good quality meat and what and there's a market for it and like can't get anything, not being able to get a process just seems like sinful to be able to find ourselves in that situation. It just seems un, unfathomable that we can't fix that somehow. And there is, Corey, a lot of federal you know, limits, I guess, right? We, we last year or two years ago, we expanded uh, on-farm butchering um, that you're, you're referencing where, where uh, we made it, we, we permitted folks to quarter animals, I think, to, to yeah. make it a little bit yeah. easier than just getting, having to say, do you want half a cow or zero? Um so we, we've been tiptoeing, but even there, you know, is even that we were kind of having to be very cautious about federal overlap. But what I don't understand is, is the demand is there. How come there's no uh, entrepreneur 
stepping up. I mean, is it maybe it's just a huge upfront cost, but maybe that's where we could push some of this one time money. I, I mean, working lands, I, I hope we will talk to them about that because we really ought to have a vision for what is the capacity and then you know what is the capacity for processing meat and then you know where's the biggest hole right now regionally you know folks are talking about bringing bringing animals to pennsylvania to get slaughtered that's ridiculous yeah, yeah. yeah that's kind of crazy to truck truck the animals to pennsylvania and and then truck the meat back we may as well do that here and and uh, ship it finish to wherever it's going. Um, I know, you know, last last fall when we were dishing out uh, the COVID money, um, we talked to the agency in some regards about pushing some of that money toward the uh, slaughter facilities. Yeah. Well, it all happened too late. Uh, they they had to do they did do an inventory of what slaughterhouses felt that they could use uh, if they needed to expand to to do more uh, if they wanted to expand so uh, they have all that information uh, in regards to expanding the slaughter and packing facilities. Uh, so we could have um, uh, Abby, I believe either she did that or she had one of her people do that. And they have a report uh, <clears throat> that they could certainly um, share with us to see if we do get more COVID money and money that can help, uh, that would certainly help a lot on the beef uh, industry and help people with with a few animals to be able to get in. Yeah, I think we should really make a pitch for seeing if COVID funds could be used to do this, to invest in some kind of manufacturing plant in terms of helping the overall rural economy come back from COVID. I mean, I even remember when, you know, we live in Middlesex and we used to like raise lamb and raise sheep and Years ago, we had to stop doing it because we used to bring our lambs, our sheep to um, our lamb to Hyde Park, and they shut down. And then we had to take it to St. Johnsbury. And for even you know, for the dozen lambs that we were going to do in a year, like driving them to St. Johnsbury to be slaughtered, just didn't make sense. So we stopped doing it. It's just a really small scale kind of thing, but it just shows you how, like, you know, it was just it was ridiculous to go to the other side of St. All, other side of St. Johnsbury to get them slaughtered from not for the Montpelier area. Didn't make any sense. So I, I would really hope that we would find a way to challenge the state to come up with some COVID funds to help solve this problem. It's, it's and the other not, thing, Chris, keep in mind, it's not a very attractive industry. You know, I mean, there's a lot of people who don't want to be slaughtering animals. I mean, that's a reality. I mean, because one of the things we found over the years was it was hard to find a workforce that wanted to do this kind of work. I mean, it's obviously maybe it's coming back as an attractive thing to do, but not a lot of people want to spend their day slaughtering animals quite honestly it's just it's just a reality yeah that's fair well we have the workforce um you know across the board is challenging but yeah, yeah that's fair I, I, you know it strikes me as a working lands question um but it's probably the money is is a big piece of scale um it, it's out of scale with typically what they do but it'd be be worth exploring with them yeah, um, the uh, no, we've got um, we've got some work ahead of us with with this whole you know this whole issue. Um, <clears throat> our and of course our focus uh, is pretty much on food security and and how to bring that along. I don't um, I don't expect us to spend a lot of time on this, but I think. Um, you know, for all the work that uh, DRF uh, put into this and, and uh, that we, we put into it, um, I think we, you know, we've got to try to do something positive 
and uh, to hand off to the uh, task force. Uh, I think we have a there. We have a limit on. I think we have to do something like within forty-five days or so. So, um, you know, we we can't spend a lot of time at this, but we've got to we've got to be able to move. Uh, we want to be. I want to be able to move forward uh, with it, and um, so. Um, that's where we are with that. Uh, the so what'd you find out, Brian? Well, I don't know whether because we're on YouTube. I don't want to put a, put any information out there that. Well, anyway, uh, there's five people that work in a, one of the departments at the hospital that have tested positive. So now they're trying to go back and trace who they got, you know, what patients they interacted with, if they yeah. got if they got discharged from the hospital, where those people went. So it's kind of like that domino effect. But to me, it wasn't, it wasn't as serious as I thought. When I hear a, vi a virus outbreak, I think of, you know, a hundred people. Um, it was five people. And um, I, I think we were all a little bit less concerned by the end of the meeting. I know, yeah. Sen did, did Senator Polina have, get a chance to weigh in on his deal? No, there's it's getting closer to 100 where I was. Um, yeah, that's what I thought I'd heard. Part too. of it is that they're finding that for these younger people, younger people used to get when they got, I should say used to it if it's years ago, but younger people were getting a couple of symptoms, like one or two symptoms and then getting better. Now they're getting a dozen symptoms at the same time. So they're seeing, it's getting harder for them to come out of it. They're getting a broader array of symptoms when they ah. get the, when they get the virus, so they're sicker this time around than they were last time when they had the outbreak. Well, <clears throat> they, yeah, had them quarant they had them quarantining, quarantine in your room with your roommate. So it's like kind of duh, you know. I mean, quarantine should imply that you're on your own, not with a roommate. Up here, the universities have a quarantine dorm. Or a whole, yeah. did they not, maybe they just don't have the building space at Norwich. They have some, but not enough. They have quarantine housing, but it's not enough. You would, you would think that <clears throat> at the hospital, they were, our hospital, most of them were all vaccinated. Uh, golly, a week and a half, two weeks ago. And, and that was, yeah, that was brought up, Bobby. Of course, you got to get two shots, right? So the, the great majority of the workers did get the first one. Some have not had the second one yet. The other piece of that is after you get the second one, it's still a week or two before you're completely immunized. Yeah. And it all, all it means is, and it's not 100% effective, it's like 95, okay? But then the other part of it is, you are immunized for yourself, but that doesn't mean that you don't still have it and can give it to somebody else. So there's a whole bunch of different things going on and uh, I don't know what the heck to do. I think I'm just gonna stay in my room forever. <laughs> yeah. We'll be with you, don't worry. I know, I know I'm getting damn sick of being cooped up. <laughs> yeah. It, um... Yeah. How's, how's Mrs. Star feel about it? <laughs> she said that in all the years, I probably spent more time at home with, <laughs> since COVID come and I did in all the previous years. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, why don't we take a little break? And we have Ellen coming in at 10, I think 10.15. Is that right, Linda? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, why don't we, um, we'll stay right on. Just uh, you can close your, your uh, camera and zoom off. Uh, Kelly, uh, thanks a lot for being with us. If you want to stay for uh, Alan Keeler, you're more than welcome to. Uh, we've got a, a hodgepodge of things to visit with her about. So it, it, I don't know your time schedule, but 
if you want to stay, you're welcome. And if you have other things to do, um, you know, that you plan, uh, feel free to, to do either. Great. Thank you, Senator Starr. Yeah. Hi, Ellen. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good. Good. A little chilly up north. I don't know about down in the banana belt. Well, I'm in Starksboro at 1,200 feet, so we've got nine, negative 19 wind chill. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Are we going to um, talk a little about uh, talk a little about sustainable foods and all that? Or yeah, I'm I'm going to talk with you about uh, the notion of food security in terms of some regional food supply, and I have a suggestion for some uh, legislative language that you might be interested in. And um, and uh, just so you know, then we have a good three hours planned for February 11th to go over the strategic plan. Uh, does Linda have that date and yep. all that? Yep. Yeah, good, good. Yeah. And, then, yeah. and then you're gonna be speaking at the press conference on February 8th. So I'm gonna give you some talking points if you would like to have them. For, for that? February 8th, yeah, for the press conference where we formally release the plan. Yeah. At 11 o'clock, um, we'll be sending you out early next week. I'm going to be sending you what you need for February 8th. And uh, mm -hmm. next Wednesday, I'll be putting the plan in the mail to you. So you will have it in your physical hands before the press conference. Yeah, that sounds sounds good. Yeah. Um, well, we spent quite a lot of time talking with different groups and hearing from different groups. And uh, uh, Mr. Poisoner uh, from UVM, from the uh, Gun Institute, he, uh, you know, he wants to help out any way he can and thought that your, you know, your plan, um, goes a long ways in helping to, um, you know, to alleviate some of these problems. So yes. the, um, that's our hope. Yeah. Well, um, if Linda, are we back uh, live? We are. Yeah. And well, Ellen, I just made Ellen host so, co host so she can show her documents. Yeah, right. very Thanks. good. Uh, and uh, Corey will be along with us uh, momentarily. There he is. He is back. Uh, so, yep. uh, Ellen, we, we've we got about an hour or so that we can spend with you, and we don't want to waste any of your time or hours. So why don't you, uh, I think, do you know all the members? Do you know Corey? Parent we haven't had really the privilege of, of meeting and having real discussion. We we sort of know each other in the hallway kind of thing, right? Yep, absolutely. Looking forward to working with you. Yeah, you yep. too. So why don't uh, why don't you uh, tell us what we should know? All right. Well, thank you very much for the record, Ellen Kaler, Vermont Sustainable jobs fund so i appreciate the opportunity to chat this morning um, because i understand that you all are are contemplating how to help uh get vermont on a an accelerated path to increasing the availability of vermont and uh regional food uh from a food security angle so if getting more of vermont products uh, into places where people normally shop. I know Senator Pearson, this is a, um, a, a, a great interest to you, thinking about how do we get more Vermont products just in the grocery stores? How do we get more uh, uh, Vermont meat uh, on, on the shelves, which of course requires more uh, infrastructure. Um, so uh, what I'm hoping to do today is to share a little bit about um, some work that that I have been doing 
uh, for many years now with my counterparts in the other five New England states and where we're talking about how to develop more of a regional food system that would provide greater amount of products uh, from the region for the region and, and, and would uh, address some of the challenges that we saw during COVID with the supply chains breaking, where we saw the meat processing plants in the Midwest go down for a while because of COVID. Um, and as we're thinking about the potential shocks to our food system and our food supply chain because of climate change type events, you know, natural disasters, uh, future pandemics, how can we build in some greater resiliency and ability to meet our needs closer in? So what I'd like to do is to share with you a little bit about some work that we've got going. And then there's a specific ask that I have of you all to consider if you're putting together a food security type bill, um, which speaks to some planning for emergencies that I think would be uh, that uh, we're trying to get all six states, their legislatures to pass similar language that would instruct their emergency management operations uh, teams to put into the emergency management plan uh, efforts to strengthen and increase the availability of locally or regionally sourced food as a means of, of increasing um, access, but also decreasing the vulnerability of our supply chains. Does that sound okay? It's what you signed up for. That sound, sounds good. Is, is that going to, can we just do that with legislation in each state or do we have to make that into a compact of some type? No, I think we can do it at each state because each state has a emergency management plan. And in this case in Vermont, we have the emergency management plan. There's, a, there's an agency of ag annex. Uh, and, and on your webpage, I provided the, Linda put up for you the latest version of that. And so after I go through these slides, we can focus and spend some more time on that and how I think the passing very simple legislation agencies on board with, um, you can, um, we can get this sort of codified and get the process rolling uh, in this way. Yeah, good. Okay. All right, so let me just um, share then a few slides because uh, I think you'll be interested hope you'll be interested in um, some of what uh, we might be able to start moving towards both as a state and as a region. And we're calling this project New England Feeding New England, Cultivating a Reliable Food Supply. Um, and we, my counterparts and I have uh, secured some funding for the next uh, two years to be able to do the planning stages of this work, but we're really seeing this as a 15 year effort. So I'm not sure if you all saw this, but this is a really, this really jarred me when I first saw this. It came out uh, referenced in the New York Times last summer. And it's a, a study that was done out of the University of Illinois that looked at the actual flow of food using the US Tran uh, Agency of Transportation's, what they call the Commodity Flow Survey data. And what this does is the Agency of Transportation wants to know how, how are, products being moved across roads, bridges, rail, and air from a transportation planning perspective. So what's really interesting about this is this really shows where is product coming into the country? In the case of you take a look at California, the concentration there, almost mo the ma vast majority of food coming into this country comes through the port of Los Angeles. So mm -hmm. you might say, wow, that's really efficient. Wow, we got all this food moving through there. Well, if something happens to the port of Los Angeles, we're screwed. We're, <laughs> Basically, we're done. Right? So the same thing, concentration in the Midwest. So you think about over the summer, over uh, April and May when those uh, meat processing plants went down. You can see where there's this concentration of activity of food flowing back and forth uh, out of the, in and out of the Midwest. Then you take a look at the Northeast and what do you see? You see a concentration along I-95 corridor. Well, if you think about wh what are some of our biggest challenges in this region from a climate perspective, it's hurricanes coming up the East Coast. Uh, it is um, uh, other kinds of natural disasters that might happen or infringe upon 
um, that Northeast uh, corridor there, which could creates a, a sense of vulnerability potentially um, that we, we think is important to address. Yes. So if you take, think this is, this was also from this past fall, uh, some analysis done to take a look at where what's expected from a climate change perspective. So the green areas here along the, of the Northeast, it's, you know, we're at greater risk for hurricanes and high water events, which could impact roads, for instance, roads and bridges or rail lines, um, as we've seen in the past. In the Midwest, they're, they're going to be impacted by extreme heat. But as we saw a couple years ago, they also had extreme flooding events that happened. And then, of course, the wildfires in the in California put pressure on the Central Valley and water supplies out in the West, where a lot of our food comes from. So, given these potentials, um, there's some real uh, need, I think, for some future-oriented planning to 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 try to reduce the risks that we have here in the Northeast because of the fact that we have this infrastructure, the the transportation flows are the way they are. So and the other reason for doing this, quite frankly, gets to what has been happening, and you all know this, over the last 50 years, there's been a massive consolidation across the food system in processing and production and retail and distribution, where fewer and fewer large companies control the vast majority of the, the infrastructure of the, of the actual uh, businesses in the system. And while, again, from an efficiency standpoint, you could be like, well, bigger is better, it's more efficient and all that. It also creates greater vulnerabilities, yep. right? We yep. don't have then competition. We, we, we you know, yeah. like we, we are at risk. So for all those reasons, uh, we think that it's time to think about this. Now, I'm going to shift into a couple of slides that get at this question that I think Senator Pearson and others talk think about a lot, which is estimating food production. So we took a look at the uh, latest ag census and the NAS data. And if you take a look across New England, we produce 7.5 billion pounds of food across the six states of New England, that first column there. And you can see here on this slide what the breakdown is of different product types, okay? Now take a look over at the far right there under the Vermont column. So in Vermont, we produce 2.9 billion pounds, but 2.7 billion pounds of that is in dairy. So in essence, what you can see here is we're, we're providing, and you all know this, we're providing the bulk of the dairy products for the whole of New England, and we're also selling beyond New England, but we, we, we produce a good chunk of what New England consumes from dairy. <laughs> you take a look at Maine, their largest crops are down in vegetables, potatoes, melons. It's actually potatoes. So from the standpoint of like, what do, what do Vermonters, what do New Englanders actually need to eat, want to eat, you know, like to put food on the table, the basics, um, we are out of balance here in terms of what, how much we're producing of what products and for whom. So to me, this is, this yeah. provides a really good sense of like, wow. What could Vermont be doing more of? We could be doing more of hogs and pigs. We could be doing more in vegetables. We only have 21 uh, million pounds of vegetables, whereas uh, Maine has 1.5 billion pounds. Now, potatoes are heavier than lettuce, of course, but th the point being, there's a lot more that we could be doing uh, if we're thinking from the standpoint of feeding Vermonters and feeding New England. So uh, we're lagging in seafood, yeah. I noticed. We are? Yes. Yeah, we got to work on that. <laughs> well, you know, rising sea levels, you know, you never know how far up the ocean might come to our border. <clears throat> but if you go to <clears throat> like eggs on that chart you just had, uh, poultry and eggs, uh, you know, it looks like there's a lot of room for expansion there. We also do well in maple Exactly, syrup. exactly. Yeah. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yeah, exactly. So again, the point here is, you know, in, in classic capitalism, you know, there's like we, um, people, different states and different regions have, have um, areas where they can excel and they trade their surplus and all of that. Can but you, I think we're, go ahead, Senator Pearson. 
So, so talk to me about the per capita availability. What does that mean? So if you, if you think about the number of people in New England, there are about 15 million people across the six New yeah. England states. You divide 15 million into 7.5 billion, and that just gives you a rough sense of we produce 505 pounds of food per person in New England from what we produce in New England, right? But that's nowhere near what we actually need. And I'm sorry, I don't have that number off the top of my head, but in terms of the number of pounds of food that each person eats in the course of a, of a year is much greater than that. And what we can produce across the, all of these product categories in New England is five and a half pounds or five, 500 so, pounds. So, um... I'm sorry, but I mean, we could, I think, spend the whole day on this chart. It's really interesting. So, so on eggs, 0.88% is what New England. So is that trying to say that New England produces less than 1% of the eggs it consumes? Correct. Okay. And so of the eggs that are produced in New England, we're making 12. That's where I don't understand how can 12 plus 0.78 equal, see what I'm saying? Well, because those yeah. numbers are relative to Vermont. Okay, okay. As so to across all of New England. So uh, across New England, it's 0.88. But just in Vermont, we're producing 12% yeah. for what we consume here in Vermont. What we're producing in Vermont could meet our availability. Sorry, it's the availability. So. We are producing 7.7 .7 million pounds of eggs, which represents uh, that that uh, per capita in Vermont, Vermont could Vermonters could consume 12 could consume 12 pounds of eggs. That's what's available if they chose to buy Vermont eggs. That doesn't mean that they are doing that. It just means that it's available. It's what we're okay. producing. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, any other questions on this? I, I'm going to keep going on this, but just show it in a couple different formats so that it might be helpful to see magnitudes yeah. here. Yeah. Um, right. so, Go ahead. Um, so this is another way to think about it. This is in a pie chart format, that same chart. So Maine produces 2.6 billion pounds of food. Vermont, 2.9 billion pounds. And then you can see the other states and then, but then again, where's the concentration? The concentration is in dairy at 4.3 billion pounds, 1.8 billion pounds in vegetables, which is primarily potatoes. And then everything else is 1.3 billion pounds or just 17%. Yeah. So, so a lot again, of room. there's a lot of room for diversification, right? Is what it's saying. If the intention is to be doing more of feeding ourselves, which has not been the intention of our ag policy nationally um, in the past, right? Mm -hmm. So another way to look at it is this. This is in some ways even a starker way to look at it, right? Look at look at it, along those bottom there. We 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 can do feed. We we can we we can do more eggs. We can do more poultry. We can do more lamb. We can do more vegetables. If we had the land and production and, and farmers and food producers, you know, really fo uh, expanding what we're actually doing. Now, one question, uh, Ellen, that I'm sure we will get, are those numbers, those low numbers, are they, can we do it in a competitive way, price-wise, to make a living if we bump those numbers all up to compete against where they're coming from at the present, or if they're coming from, you know, if the tariffs need to be changed or, or what? It's a, that's an excellent question. And we, you can't not look at this without thinking about the consumer demand side and the price point side. You're absolutely right. And right now today, we know that our cost of production is higher in the Northeast and in New England in particular, and even Vermont in particular to that because of our winters, our growing season, cost of importing feed, like all of these 
reasons, right, that we know about means that the cost of production is higher than in other parts of the country. So then that does bring into question federal policy about what are we subsidizing with our tax dollars? How much, you know, so how do we think about shifting some of the, the subsidies that have been going to corn, wheat, and soy in the Midwest and think about diversifying those, those available tax dollars to be supporting more regional food production for regional consumption that would then put more into say what's called the specialty crop uh, areas that the USDA funds, right? But you take a look at the, I think we get like $150,000 a year or something like that for specialty crop block grant grant money. Like that, that should be just completely blown up into millions of dollars if we're really talking about doing more R&D on, on the kind of products that could be grown here. And that could then increase quantities with the intention then of also continuing to, to, to try to keep the price point where people can afford it. But as you know, <laughs> then you have to think about wages and people's earnings. And I mean, all of that stuff ends up coming into this. So there's no like, you know, magic bullet here that's going to fix this. But you're right. Thinking about tariff policy, thinking about subsidy policy, thinking about the farm bill, all of that needs to play into this. Yep. So to me, this is the biggest like aha moment for me recently in looking at this stuff. We produce 7.5 billion pounds of food in New England and we import 71 billion pounds, right? Uh -huh. So our best guess estimate, we don't know this, this is just like literally our best guess <clears throat> is that across New England, regional food consumption is probably around 10%, right? That, that's yep. what our guess is. In Vermont, we, we, we know it's north of 15% for Vermont consumed food. Across the region, we're thinking maybe about 10%. So what we're, we're planning for in this project is putting out there the potential target of what would it look like? What would it take to get to 35% regional food consumption by 2035. Could we set a target of 15 years from now where we change the, 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 the size of these circles? So we're not talking about making New England an island. We're just saying, can we shrink the, the, the amount of food being imported and grow the, the circle, the, 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 the amount that's actually being produced in New England and that stays in New England for regional consumption? <clears throat> that, so we're if if we could New England's total is seventy one billion pounds that that we use we we import in yep mm -hmm. and we're only producing ten percent of that basically yep uh, seven point five yep yep and if you if you had the map of of the states up there, I I bet if you showed the available land mass to grow or produce these crops, you know we're probably in the best shape uh, or in in pretty good shape to have the the extra land or the land available to grow and harvest these crops. That's my sense too. And the other op and the other place is probably Arista County in Northern Maine in terms yeah. of having good land that's available, large tracts of it. But as we know, there's going to be continued pressure on the availability of farmland. And that's going to get ex exacerbated by climate induced migration, right? We want people to come to Vermont because we're, because of our demographic issues. So we're in, we're doing remote worker, uh, uh, support. We're trying to get some new energy, new blood, new people coming in. But we are also, if we don't manage our land use policies properly, at risk of losing prime ag soils that we're going to need to grow food on so that we can have a better chance of feeding more of ourselves. So these things have to get, have to get understood together. And that's part of what we're going to be delivering to you on the on the eleventh, with the, when the plan gets rolled out, is is that we've got this level of complexity, you know, laid out so we can help think about this. 
Senator yeah. Pearson. Um, this is very exciting. Thank you. And thank you for <laughs> you're doing a good job of how you're visually capturing it. I, um, I, I think a lot about climate and I think a lot about resiliency and for many years have argued that some of our population challenges, uh, the green revolution, we used to call it, you know, um, I guess, I guess what I want to say is, seems to me that the food revolution, actually a regenerative ag, uh, you know, a, a, a swing back to regenerative ag um, and delicious local food, really, <laughs> is there any reason to think that could work, that that will draw people in? We've heard from Te uh, Mateo, you know, bringing people in for, from all across the world, actually, to Hardwick and, and the, yeah. the impact on the local economy. Uh, do you have a slide that tells us that this is the ticket or, or any data to suggest that, yeah, this is actually potentially how we grow our population in addition to all these other benefits? You know, I don't have a slide for you, Senator. I'm sorry. But I do think <laughs> anecdotally we are seeing that. When you take a look at the ag census data, for instance, on the number of new farmers and what their profile is, they tend to be young women and they don't come from farm families. Mm -hmm. And a lot of you, you take a look at the entrepreneurs, a lot of the individuals that are, are at the head of our craft uh, brewing and distilling industries, they didn't grow up here. You know, they, they came to Vermont um, because of our, 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 our foodiness <laughs> and it is an attractor. And I think that's why you're seeing the agency of agriculture or the agency of commerce. You take a look at the new improved things, vermont.com uh, website that's coming along. They're doing even more to accentuate the food scene and the beer scene as an attractor to, to attracting people to want to move here. So anecdotally, it's, I think it's there. I don't have, we don't have hard data on it yet though. Um, so I'm not gonna go over uh, all of this here. I, the slides are up on your webpage so you can spend some more time with it. But just, this just gives you a sense of the fluidity of food flowing in and out of Vermont that is produced here. Some of this data is coming is uh, food that is originates in Canada, for instance, because it comes through our, our, our over our border and it's headed, it just passes through us. But again, because this data is from the Department of Transportation and it's about measuring the pounds of food moving across our roads, our bridges and rail, this gives you an, an interesting snapshot of the amount of food that is just flowing through our state. Some of but the majority of it is produced here and then it flows out. Okay. So again, I'm happy to spend more time on it, but I, let me just uh, go this, this view of it, I think is also uh, is instructive because what this is showing, the food flows into Vermont by region. So where, so of the food that comes in that we import, where is it actually coming from? And this largest block is what's called self loops. So this is where, for instance, let's say you're a maple sugaring operation and you're, you're just, you're getting into 50 gallon barrels. It then might go to say Butternut Mountain Farm for further processing and get sent out. So that's where there's a self loop. And again, because this data is about the movement of food products and not necessarily who's consuming it, this, this just gives you a sense of how many pounds of food are literally moving over our roads and bridges and across rail um, that is contained within Vermont. This is the self loop part. And then where the imports and the exports are. So we import 945 million pounds from other New England states. We import 913 million pounds from the Northeast, right? And then the next chart over then food flows out of Vermont, we're exporting 2.3 billion pounds to the Northeast. And again, primarily dairy, right? Yeah. Uh, we're, we're exporting 944 million pounds across the six New England states. So this just gives you a sense of like, who are our core trading partners in terms of the movement of food? Again, it does not say who's actually consuming it, 
we, we, there is a correlation there, but it's not giving you sales data. It's giving you pounds of movement. Okay. <clears throat> so here's, here's statistics, right? That the, um, that the six Northeast states are the top source and destination for most food categories uh, for each other. The greatest amount of movement of food is within New England, and then it moves to the Northeast, particularly New York, um, and then uh, the, less so for the Southwest, Inland West, and New England's smallest, uh, are, are the, the, those are the smallest regional trading partners. And so this food flow in New England of 71.1 billion pounds that flows out, there's also this, what I didn't show you was that there's, if you add it all up, there's 66 billion pounds that's flowing um, into the region. So again, some of this is um, uh, in the case of like in Maine and Rhode Island and, and Massachusetts, there's ports where there's products coming from Europe. And so they, they enter the United States and then they move, they don't necessarily get consumed in the United States, right? They, they move to other parts of the US, but their port, port, port of entry uh, is in New England. So that's where these, um, you can see these uh, bigger swings of total movement of food. Um, but I think the most important point here is that this just, this is another data set that I think confirms what we generally know, which is that our biggest trading partners are in New England <laughs> and New York. So when we think about market expansion and sales and marketing and where are we targeting, which, which markets are we trying to open up for Vermont producers? New England is a big marketplace that we have not fully penetrated, that we have opportunities in. Um, I'm gonna leave this for now because you can spend more time with it, but it basically is just another way, some more iteration on, on what I just showed you. Um, and same with these, again, just other visual ways of being able to see where um, Vermont, this is food flows into Vermont. So we're, we're bringing in 6 billion pounds of food from elsewhere, uh, which, you know, and then we're, we're, ex we're exporting uh, 2.9 billion pounds out. So this just gives you a sense of, of the regions that we send that, that food is flowing into Vermont from, into Vermont from these regions. And then in particular, where there's a little icon of a farm barn, that shows you the, the state that within that region, the, the, where the majority is coming from, the top originator. So in the, of, the, of the things we get from, Iowa, from, the, from the Midwest, Iowa sends us the most, is all that's saying. So in New England, in terms of food coming into us, it's coming from Massachusetts. <clears throat> okay, so this is this then from the outflows. So if we're sending, what would um, you, what would, what product is that coming out of Mass? Um, let's Blue, see, blueberries or something. Massachusetts flows into Vermont. We're getting 6 million pounds of live, of live animals. We're getting some cereal grains. We're getting sort of general ag products would probably be vegetables and uh, sort of a whole range Then animal feed, meat and poultry, grains and baked products. So yeah. it's, you know, it, it, we haven't fully mined this, this data yeah. set. Um, uh, and actually, this data is from 2012, and there is a, there is new data in 20, of, of 2017 that the, the these researchers just haven't updated this, but their intention is to. So we'll see what it looks like when it gets updated. So it's about 10 years old, this data. Um, but you know, I, again, the point here is is to just get a sense of the magnitude yeah. of what's happening, and then to ask the question: Well, how what what could be different? So I've been working for the last seven, eight years of my counterparts, the farm to plate counterparts in the other states. And these are the groups uh, that exist. And they all too have some form of a statewide food system strategic plan 
that they are working to implement in different ways. Nobody is as advanced as we are here in Vermont uh, in terms of having um, the staff capacity, the funding support, Working Lands Enterprise Fund, all of those kinds of things that we, tools that we've developed over the years to support this sector um, as the envy of the rest of the region. Um, Maine actually, interestingly, is, is actively trying to see if they can get a Working Lands Enterprise Fund stood up in Maine right now um, because they see what we've been able to do with it here in Vermont. So here's our goal. Uh, so we came up with a project that we all could work on together as a full region and not just state by state by state. And that's to expand and fortify the region's food supply and distribution system to ensure the availability of adequate, affordable, socially and culturally appropriate products under a variety of rapidly changing climate, environmental and public health conditions. That's what we're ultimately trying to affect. So we have three areas that we're, work that we're gonna be working in over the next uh, bunch of years. So one is we really would like to set some production milestones uh, state by state looking at food availability data, looking at this food flows data, looking at overall US census production data, and then trying to see what could we could, how, what is each state's contribution towards the region getting to 35% regional food consumption by 2035? What would be required? How many acres of land? How many farms, farmers? How many animals? How many acres under vegetable production? And then, Think about it out along the supply chain. What's the increased uh, amount of processing capacity, new distribution routes, additional distributors that are needed, additional storage capacity and warehouse infrastructure. You start thinking about all of that, what happens as, as you increase the raw product production, you need to then also be thinking about all the other parts of the supply chain and the kind of investments, both private sector as well as public and philanthropic that are gonna be needed in order for us to be able to achieve this. All six states working together, understanding that Maine and Vermont are gonna be the biggest providers of food and Rhode Island and Connecticut and Massachusetts will be the biggest consumers of food. Um, New Hampshire will be somewhere in the, we're not really sure exactly what New Hampshire will do um, in this mix. They have some. They they have a lot of eaters, obviously, in the the lower two thirds. But they also have some production capacity ability in the in the northern one third of, of the state. So it's trying to figure out like how many acres does Maine need to bring on? How many acres does Vermont need to bring on? Where's the workforce going to come from? All of those questions uh, in that first circle, and then. Because of course, the reality of climate change, we wanna make sure that, that whatever increases in production, whether that's actual like raw production of products or food manufacturing, for instance, or storage and distribution, that we're doing it in climate friendly ways so that we're not adding to greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture and food production. <laughs> so we wanna understand what that looks like, set some baseline targets, work with extension staff across the region to try to think about how do we get more of these climate friendly practices uh, uh, no, understood, known, and in practice. But and one then thirdly- thing, um, <clears throat> One thing you do have an offset there because by being able to show where all this food is coming into from and into New England, there's a tremendous amount of truck transportation, I would presume that's doing that. And so you've got an offset of some of that, uh, uh, you know, green, positive green things. Yep. Yes. Although interestingly, there are there has been analysis done that, for instance, it's actually less of a carbon footprint to bring in lamb, uh, meat lamb, uh, to eat from New Zealand than it is to truck it around New England. Interestingly, because you can send, because they're at such a scale that you can send it in full containers and that that is actually a less carbon intensive way to do it. Now we can debate that, but it is an interesting part of the, of the discussion yeah. and shows how much we still have to, we under, need to understand about all this. That's unbelievable. I know. I, I have a hard because time I, believing it too, but. 
once it comes in, they still have to distribute it around the New yeah. England. <laughs> yeah. So yes. then the third piece, and this is what I want to you know, spend the rest of our time talking about, and uh, is around this food security emergency preparedness plans. Yes. So. And, and I wanna just distinguish here that there's a couple of, we're actually thinking about food security in, from two different perspectives, right? We normally think about food security from the standpoint of hunger alleviation, like physically getting enough food to people so that they're not food insecure. So that's still true, but we're thinking about it a little bit more broadly from the standpoint of food security from a um, decreasing the vulnerabilities of even having any food on the shelves for anybody across New England because of climate change, because of pandemics, because of unforeseen natural disasters, civil war, whatever you wanna come up with as the reason why something might happen, right? So we think that there's an opportunity to, to utilize a, a, an area of our state uh, infrastructure apparatus that hasn't yet been uh, focused on this question of food security, which is our emergency management plans. So here's what I'm, I'm sort of putting out there for your consideration, see what you think, um, is uh, to, to instruct the Agency of Agriculture to expand what's included in the Vermont Emergency Management Plan, what's called the Agency of Ag Annex, it's a separate document, but it's, a, it's like an appendix to the state's emergency management plan. And, and what we'd be asking the agency to do is to uh, create plans for supporting agricultural and processed food production expansion in the state in order to mitigate the impacts of food supply chain disruptions. So that's like the focus of why we would do this. And the plans should include instructions for making food products available to residents, as well as instructions for increasing food production within the state. Um, and to develop these in collaboration with other appropriate agencies and nonprofits. Uh, and we think that by starting this exercise of looking at this, it might mean that there's other parts of the emergency management plan that also need to get tweaked a little bit to accommodate this uh, addition of looking at planning for food security. And the second part of, of the request would be to instruct the agency to work with all of the partners who uh, to collect information about all the emergency feeding operations that were have been coordinated and stood up during the COVID-19 pandemic, such as Vermont Everyone Eats, to capture those lessons learned and best practices and to, and to get it on paper so that it can be used for future emergency events. So that's, um, so the, the intention here is, uh, and there's a one pager on the web page to, um, that uh, looks like this on your web page um, that just gives you a little bit more background on this annex because literally like like three months ago I had no idea this thing existed. <laughs> so you know all the agencies have this. It's part of the state's app emergency management and emergency preparedness apparatus, right? Each agency has certain areas that they have sort of they'll take the lead on or have jurisdiction when there's emergencies. If you take a look at the plan, which is also now on your webpage, the, their annex, it, it is focused on, understandably, on things like what happens if we have floods, like, for instance, Tropical Storm Irene, right? So after Tropical Storm Irene, we learned a lot about could the food that got flooded still be eaten or not? Uh, and how do you get food to people who are in areas that are cut off? Or for instance, let's say there's an avian flu outbreak what are the, what's the checklist for the activities that will happen when there's a sense that there might be a, an animal a disease outbreak happening? So these are basically, this is like the playbook. This is the instructions for how the agency will respond when an emergency arises. And we're suggesting here that let's, let's start thinking about uh, a more robust planning effort anticipating that there will be more food supply chain disruptions coming because of climate change and because of future pandemics and, and other things that we might not be able to totally foresee. What it would do is provide an opportunity to have conversation about what needs to get included. And it potentially could also include 
uh, agency staff doing some exercises, some actual practice events, you know, tabletop exercises, so that if something were to happen, okay, here's, we need to practice what we would do. You know, the, the Department of Health does this all the time with different scenarios, for instance. And I know that the Agency of Ag has done them in the past as well. So, but, but the, what, what's new here is to get everybody thinking about food security. And this is one tool in the toolbox that would help provide additional justification for why we need to be putting more focus on local food production and investing in the infrastructure for food production. It's not just because we all want it in our stores. It's also because we need to, because we're planning for these future uh, shock and vulnerability events. Does that make sense? <clears throat> well, it certainly, it certainly sounds like a direction that, <clears throat> that we have talked about going in, um, you know, serving New England with all different types of, of foodstuffs. And, and the dairy, you know, our dairy industry has been hit hard and, and we need some alternative products to, to fill in, uh, you know, on some farmers that have left their land and want to, of course, keep it in ag and keep it looking good and healthy. And so I, I think all of this blends right into where where we are and you know the challenge that our boss has given us is to <clears throat> you know to come out of this session with a some type of a food security plan and uh, so no I think it blends in well uh, Ellen great Anthony yeah I think it <clears throat> excuse me I think it's really good good info um, and my question is, or my hope, I guess, and you did mention this as a possibility that it would not only give us the ability to develop a plan, but hopefully give us a justification for asking for funding for infrastructure, maybe through COVID funds as well, you know, for planning for future emergencies. One thing we need to do is invest in infrastructure and make these things happen. So you think that it's possible and you're, you're thinking that it would give us a, a justification for asking for funding, pursuing yeah. funding? Yeah, I mean, think about it from the standpoint of like, as a really easy example, after Irene, right, what did we learn? We learned that our culverts were too narrow or the right. diameter is too small, right? So we made intentional investments in changing out culverts to be larger diameters, yep. right? Because we were anticipating that there would be future high water events that, that having bigger culverts would, would help with. Right. So that led to decisions about resource allocation. So I think there's a corollary there is what we're suggesting is that, you know, just having this plan as part of the emergency plan, it doesn't it doesn't in and of itself do much. But it's what do we do with having that sense that, oh, this is the kind of planning we need to do. How might that then influence um, how we then direct additional resources in infrastructure development? Um, in getting the private sector engaged with their their piece of all of this, uh, improving the 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 way that distribution happens in the state, making sure that we're able to reach all of the small producers because they have a role to play in all of this. We need it all, basically. Yeah, Chris. Um, <clears throat> you and and others involved in this work is there, or is this a next step where? we start to think about um, not just the raw volume, but okay, we're gonna continue to import bananas, but we could make a lot more eggs. Uh, we could make a lot more broccoli and we're gonna have to both import and make more tomatoes. You know, that kind of analysis, because it strikes me that that helps inform therefore the infrastructure direction. So can you talk to me, uh, talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, so as part of that planning process of getting from you know, to 35% by 2035, our current thinking is, is that there would be a state-by-state -state analysis of what could get produced and how, and how much could get produced in each of the states based on their land base, their general like 
you know, interest in <laughs> producing more food, who's already on the ground doing stuff, the, the available funding, those kinds of things. So, but the land base comes first, obviously. We have to secure the land base. So, um, and then it's an iterative process, right? Because each state is not in itself an island. If we're talking about the region, we might have a sense of what we can stand up in Vermont over a 15 year period, but then where does Maine come in? Where does Massachusetts come in? And we might have to adjust those numbers, but, but your, your general question is, yes, the intention would be to, to get at that both in Vermont, but then as a region. So I'll give you a quick uh, example of, of how we're thinking then. Once we have sort of the data, sort of like the raw data, like what might be possible, what do people tend to buy? Um, there's a, a data set uh, that looks at called the computer, the consumer expenditure survey, which breaks down by race and class, um, what, how much people spend on food, for instance. So getting a little bit more uh, sense of what people want to buy and what they would want to be sourcing from the region, for instance, right? Obviously it's not gonna be bananas, but maybe more tomatoes, maybe more eggs. So once we have that, then another critical piece is having, being in communication with producer groups to test out, like, is this even possible? Like, do you guys even wanna do this, <laughs> right? So I'll give you a quick example. Uh, as we were preparing for the strategic plan we're gonna be giving you in 10 days, we did a bunch of focus groups with producer groups and we met with the beef producers and we said, okay guys, you currently do about 17 million in sales of beef products, uh, you know, hamburger, steaks, the whole nine yards. Um, what do you, what's your sense of where you could get to in 10 years based on what you're seeing in the marketplace for consumer demand, your own interest in terms of like, do you, is, are you doing this to be in business of raising beef? Or are you doing this as a hobby? Like just trying to get a sense of their interest. And after some discussion, they were like, you know, we think we could probably almost double, you know, like maybe we get to 28, 29 million in sales in 10 years. That seems doable. And then the next question was, oh, but not if we don't have more meat processing capacity, right? So this is, this is the iterative process. We can talk to the producers, but then we have to go keep going along the supply chain to talk about the processing infrastructure, <laughs> the distribution infrastructure, or the storage infrastructure, the warehousing infrastructure. Some of it needs to be focused in Vermont, but some of it may be strategically located in, in say Massachusetts. You know, the Food Hub Collaborative Group right now is talking about like having some kind of potential for a, uh, a, uh, um, a terminal market. We're, re we're really interested in seeing about this, a terminal market, let's say in Brattleboro, that could literally be the point where all the Vermont food <clears throat> comes through to and then goes out to other parts of New England and comes back in. Well, if we could get rid of the Connecticut River, we could do part of Mass and New Hampshire and Vermont build the have a tri owned building, a tri state owned building. I mean, that's there's nothing stopping that from happening, honestly, from an investment standpoint. No, it's it's we we must work with you know, get our own act together, but work with these other New England states. It's critical because that's where the people are. I don't want to underestimate how how this is not going to be easy. Like right. this is so complicated and and even complex because mm -hmm. you got to have the workforce for it. You got to have, which means you have to have the educational system for it. I.e., like the more Vermont Tech uh, kids coming out of Vermont Tech, you need to have the the capital available to invest in the infrastructure. It's not all going to be done by state government funds. Let's hope not, uh, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Ellen, I'm just wondering, have you spoken to the agency uh, about this appendix? And Yes. You yeah. have? Yeah. And Before I came to you guys, I wanted to make sure that they were going to be okay with it. So, yes. Good I idea. Talked with, I talked with Abby and Allison, and they talked with Anson and Diane, and Diane already has an idea of how they could go through it. So, again, I don't, I don't think this is I'm hoping this doesn't have anybody that's going to be upset about this because like this is just makes eminent sense to me. Well, anytime you change anything, you always have problems. Uh, you know, 
<clears throat> Maybe but, with the exception of a light bulb, but then they'll argue over what type and how many watts it should be. <laughs> well, the good news is, though, you know, the silver lining of COVID is many of us knew that this was, we were vulnerable before the pandemic, right? And what became really super clear is just how vulnerable we are because of the pandemic. And so I think we actually kind of have this once in a lifetime, once in a generation opportunity to really call into question our food supply chain and what do we want it to look like 30 years from now or 15 years from now and really get behind that, uh, that effort and, and make it and see if we can make it happen. Because there's more and more people that have had experience with it. They've had direct experience with it, going to the supermarket and certain things that they expected to be there wasn't there. Have, have you uh, presented this to the House Committee? I did on Tuesday, yes. Yeah. And are they excited about it? Or Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think it would be, it'd be fabulous for you and uh, Chair Partridge to, to confer on how you if you're interested, how you'd like to move this forward. <clears throat> yeah, well, um, it depends on how, you know, I mean, we have the time to do it because we planned on doing this and, uh, but uh, both of us are lacking our, uh, our legislative draft person right now, but, um, it, Michael may be back this coming week so that, uh, you know, we, or have you, have you put together a draft plan yet? Or? No, the, oh. that, that word document that I, that's on your page is the closest I've got. And that, that is built off of language that's currently being considered in Massachusetts. Uh, we're, we're uh, a little bit farther behind in the other four states getting it introduced, but it's, it's making its way through like the steps that it needs to go to in those states. <laughs> so what would be great is within the next two years, if all six states had something similar on the books instructing their departments of ag to do this, then we, again, we're starting to build that infrastructure of, of, of awareness about um, that we're all in this together. And we're all moving in the same direction to make this happen. Yeah. Anthony, did you, yeah, go yeah, ahead. I just wonder, is this something we have to legislate? It's a good question. I mean, technically speaking, if you know, we could probably just have a conversation with the agency and they would do it. I, for me, the benefit of having it be something that you're requesting is then more of you guys actually know about it and then can, right. can ask about it and can study it and can it gives a little bit more, um, you know, stamp of approval, so to speak, yeah. and gravitas uh, to the importance of it. I agree. I mean, I think it should be legislated in order to really move it along, put some power behind it. I mean, it also reminds me of how people are talking about um, resolutions saying that, for instance, racism is a public health problem, those kinds of things, making that kind of statement. And this would be making it clear that, you know, food security is or lack of food security is a really a serious public health problem for the state of Vermont in the coming yeah. years. And this is one way to fix it is to make sure that we have that we're planning for the future. So I, I think legislating it, it's a good idea. I didn't know if we had to, as opposed to whether or not just asking them to do it. Because sometimes we ask them to do things, they don't necessarily do them. <laughs> yeah. But um, I think it has big implications, right? Because if, uh, as I said, securing the land base to be able to have enough acres of prime ag land that that is still in production means that we have to be thinking about what happens when that dairy farm down the road unfortunately goes out. You know, like what happens to that land and how do we think about we need more housing in the state? Where is that housing located? You know, and making sure that it's not going on prime ag land. It means that as we're thinking about bringing in remote workers uh, who have a lot more money potentially at their disposal, that they're not buying a 250 acre farm with no intention of it ever being worked again, because that land is finite. Once it goes out of production, out of the hands of somebody that wants to work it, it's gone. And that, that, that in and of itself is a, is a major vulnerability for us, given our size. We had that discussion earlier this morning, actually, on, from our meeting yesterday about farm, farmers leaving the land and what, you know, what happens. Uh, Chris, uh, do you have a question? Yeah, well, uh, 
it just strikes me that this is the, 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 we're all heartbroken when we hear another farm is going out of business. But this is sort of the flip of that is, hey, there's another opportunity that just opened up down the road. And, and it's so sensitive, you know, it's terrible for that family. And, and so, um, you know, I know my comments, I try to be careful and people think, oh, you, you can't stand dairy. No, that, that's, you know, dairy is vital to our community and to our economy. And what you're discussing is sort of this opportunity. So I, I almost wonder if we need to have, you know, the land trust has, has developed some programs that, that can ease some of the urgency. When a farm says, oh my God, we're bankrupt. We gotta, we gotta sell, we gotta liquidate. There's a, it's often very quick is my understanding. And the neighbor, often the bigger farmer buys the land or leases the land and eases that problem. But there, to me, what you're describing sparks the need for some way to say, for some entity to say, okay, we'll help you. We'll get you out of debt right now. We'll buy the farm or we'll put it in a holding. And then some, some analysis that says, you know, hogs would make a lot of sense here. There's a slaughter facility, whatever. I mean, and I don't, I don't know how to do that. It's really dicey because it's private property and it's deeply emotional for people that have given generations of effort and so i don't i don't mean to make light of it i hope people aren't hearing that but but somehow this connection to to land ownership stewardship and opportunity um we got to think that through and and um it's going to take a lot of brains and and it's more than just the agency i I suspect yeah yeah it's a good point yeah. What about yeah? What about economic development people? Or have have they you've approached them, or they need approaching, or uh, because we are going to need um, <clears throat> we are going to need money, uh, you know, to build out build these uh, slaughter facilities. Uh, maybe a packing house eventually. Uh, you know. We're we're kind of all in this together, um, yep. and um, so we have we have not spoken to them yet, but they are definitely on the the list of rounds we need to make. Um, a lot of this is going to be you're going to see it in ten days with the new ag strategic plan because we have a brief, for instance, on food security that calls for a food security plan to get developed. And we have in additional market, uh, additional uh, product briefs uh, built on what we, you know, you saw last year at this time. But additional products that look at things like swine and eggs and poultry meat, and that um, about the opportunities. But the recommendations focusing on what's the infrastructure needed, or what's the legislative change that's needed to enable that. Um, we have a new brief coming on uh, the metro- mo- metropolitan markets and what the opportunity is uh, within the 250 mile radius of Vermont, for instance. We've got a marketing brief that really gets at what are the challenges that producers have of getting their products and talking about their products in the marketplace and what do they need to do? So a lot of the parts and pieces will be coming to you in 10 days in the plan itself. Um, And then I think the work ahead is then figuring out, okay, what are the pieces we wanna move first? What's the stuff that the legislature needs to move on? What's the stuff the agency of ag needs to move on? What's the stuff that commerce needs to move on? What's the stuff that extension needs to move on? You know, all of those things. What's Vermont Tech's role in all of this? Um, That's the work of the next, you know, year to two years is really getting that moving um, to to be uh, really implementing. Yeah. Um, Including money. (laughs) Well, it's going to, you know, you don't get anywhere without money. Uh, and and uh, once, once you get the idea put together so it makes sense, you know, most of our colleagues under, you know, once you can present it to them so they can understand it, uh, but we have to understand it first, but, uh, you know, We've, we've never had too many problems going to get money, um, you know, so um, 
I'm not worried about that as long as we've got it figured out in a way that we can explain it uh, that, uh, that really does the trick. Yeah, well, as a for instance, you know, with all the recommendations from the briefs, we counted up what the folks that wrote the briefs, the subject matter experts, and uh, there's about 32, 33 million dollars worth of needed investment. And some of it's one time and a lot of it is year over year uh, programs that need to be supported if we're really going to build this out not saying that that all comes from the state, but just like we tried as much as possible to quantify, like if we were to move forward on this, what would it really cost? And the other big piece of this, and we talked a little bit about this with you last January, is the need for more boots on the ground. We came up with, there's 33 positions um, that uh, are needed just in technical and business assistance to work with producers uh, to be able to have the supports they need for things like marketing and agronomic support and uh, water quality improvements and the whole nine yards. Like we just have not invested in the people power we need. That's that support ring of people that then helps the producers to do what they do best, which is produce the food and move the food. Yeah. Well, any other questions, people? Anthony? No, just two things. One, it reminds me again of the need to, we need a food security czar to sort of administer all this stuff and make sure that it happens. But I also, do, do we have your slides? Can we, the slides yeah, that you showed us, do we need email to us or something? They are on your web page. I had sent them to, to Linda. And okay, sorry, I didn't look yet. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I'll make make sure that Linda gets us to all of us, those pages. And um, so we can look them over. Yeah, and what one of the things that's up on your webpage for today for my, my, my uh, talk on the agenda is the annex itself. So you can read through it and you can right, see that's what I'd like to do. what's covered and then it'll be really clear what's not there. Right. And, and yeah. the kind of format that it's in, that, that will also, I think, give you a good sense of, of uh, like, just the level of detail or not that's needed. So uh, just to know, this is the plan and it is gonna be put in the mail to you next Wednesday. It will be sent to your home so that when we meet with you on the 11th, you can have it in front of you because um, it's, it's a big document, but I think it's one of these documents you're gonna wanna you know, earmark and and put tabs on and keep it because this is this is a ten year plan. So we wrote it with the intention that this is gonna this is gonna live a, a long time. Um, so I encourage you to uh, you know you won't need to read it all before Thursday, <laughs> the eleventh. It's really just so you have it uh, as we're as we're talking about the highlights of it. Yeah. Um, anything uh, we have to be on the floor at eleven thirty. So. Oh my goodness. Uh, Anything else from any other committee? Um, if not, uh, thank you very much, Ellen. Thank you. And, um, we'll, um, you know, we'll be looking forward to working with you and others uh, on uh, hopefully promoting and pushing uh, this along. Great. So, thank you so much for the opportunity. Great questions. Yeah. Have a good weekend. Uh, yeah. Um, bye bye. So uh, thanks, guys, and uh, you got to get dressed. I'm already dressed for the house, but a uh, couple of you have got some work to do. Um, <laughs> um, we'll, see, we'll see on the floor. <laughs> Linda, Linda um, will send you next week's schedule, and if you've got something you want to add or delete from it, uh, you know, feel free to let me know. Bobby, so with uh, that, Bobby, Jim sent us the I link. I think we had a, Jim. Uh, yeah, to that. Yeah. Okay.